conscious of that. Uh, for the purposes of the transcription and the record, if you could just introduce your name uh, and where you're from every time you speak, that'll help with the, tran the uh, transcription services as well. And along the lines of it being interactive, um, for those who are active in social media on Facebook or Twitter, encourage you during the course of the session and even in the days to come to uh, be vocal on Twitter, talk about the things you've learned, some of the things that you didn't know, uh, and as always, include that IGF-12 hashtag for the Twitter users. Um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, is, this panel I think is mostly insightful for those of us who work in this space for a living, is that sometimes it's very easy for us to lose sight of the issues and how they translate and what they mean to youth in particular. Um, as I mentioned, this group has been doing this sort of track at the IGFs for the last few years, and as Ann Collier is going to talk about, you know, we are very much surprised by a lot of the things that we hear, especially from the youth participants, and we want to be surprised again. It's very enlightening. It uh, helps the, the professionals like Kim and Ann who are working this every day to adjust their messaging and look into different ways to approach this very important topic. Um, as I mentioned, our, our, our two sort of how should we call them, expert panelists or adult panelists, I don't know what to call you, but uh, uh, are Kim Sanchez, who's the Director of Trustworthy Computing, Communications, Privacy, and Online Safety at Microsoft Corporation. She's based in Seattle. Uh, Kim was also the immediate past chair of the United States-based Family Online Safety Institute, which is also active uh, in Europe and the Mideast as well. And then Ann Collier, who's going to kick it off with a little more history on this panel and sort of the issue is the co-director, along with Larry Magid, sitting over here, of ConnectSafely.org. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ann to sort of get the conversation started, and then I'll bring us back with some questions for our youth participants. Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I think this is maybe one of the most important conversations here at the Internet Governance Forum because it's, it's about all of us, um, all of us working, in, uh, working together in a, in a networked world. This is largely um, a youth panel. I'm just going to talk for like a minute or two, and then we're going to turn it over to an amazing group of people with really wonderful, diverse perspectives. And some of them are up here, and some of them are down there. Um, we have um, Victor here from Denmark. I'm trying to see everybody. Past Jim is Arzu from our host country here, Azerbaijan. And, and way down there is Pat from Hong Kong, right, Pat? So we have um, the Caucasus region, East Asia, and Northern Europe. Um, I hail, Jim and I hail from the United States as well as Kim. And then we have three more Danish youth and more young people from Hong Kong. And somewhere is Berdia. There's Berdia from Georgia and Sandro from Georgia. Um, so we're well represented here in the Caucasus region. A little bit about digital citizenship. You know, in my country, and, and I think many others really, the term digital citizenship developed within the youth internet safety discussion. But citizenship is too big to be limited to the promotion of a specific agenda in any single country, no matter how well-intentioned. And citizenship is too broad and well-established a concept to apply to a single age demographic, right? It's not just for children. Um, you know, we're all digital citizens. Right, regardless of age and nationality, because the internet is global, digital citizenship needs to be kept large enough to embrace users everywhere in this networked world. But it's also not just digital, correct? Internet use is embedded in everyday life. So we aren't talking about some kind of special citizenship for when you're online or on mobile phones. So th this is our third IGF. So Jim beat me, he, this is his fourth. But we started this conversation in Vilnius, Lithuania, and carried on last year in Nairobi, Kenya. This year we are delighted to get views on what digital citizenship means from an even broader group of views and perspectives. And more and more, we've been featuring the views of youth, specifically teens and young adults, because they are quite fluent in digital media and are growing up with a global perspective. We find their views really helpful, free of the preconceptions and fears of those of us who grew up in a different media era or a different paradigm, really. So what we are leaving out of this discussion is preconceptions about digital citizenship, 
geographical, cultural, topical, or demographic. And in this workshop, we are asking, listening, discussing, not telling or teaching or preaching. No agenda or political view is being promoted here. This workshop is to learn about various views of what citizenship looks like in our own spaces and to see where the commonalities and differences are and understand each other's views better. Because by definition, citizenship needs to be crowdsourced. It hasn't been defined. We're all figuring it out as we go along, as we develop the social norms of social media at, as humanity. So just for the sake of discussion, you all have handouts, right? Um, I, there are some talking points there. I'm only gonna look at that second panel um, on the piece of paper you got of the five elements of digital citizenship that I've seen discussed in a number of countries and forums and papers and research studies. Since the term was coined in the US, it started being used about 2004. And um, you know what, what we'd like to do now is see if people, if, if these elements resonate with the young people in this room and whether or not they're relevant or we, they, they want to toss them out. They have an entire, entirely different definition. So that, that's where we're going to start the discussion with each individual's own experiences as citizens of a networked world. And then we're going to you know, talk about what this concept is and whether it translates. Your turn, Jim. If I can get the microphones to work. Um, so yeah, you know, I think what, uh, what what Pam said, and we're stressing is this very much is about the youth. It's not about the adults sitting at the at the at the dais here. We want to pick your brains, we want to get your insights, and we want to use that sort of research and that feedback uh, going forward to help further develop and design these programs. So we're going to start down here. There's one question we want, and if you're not seated at the table, we encourage you to sit at the table. Um, we're going to ask the youth sort of tell us a little bit, an introduction, a little bit about yourself, real brief and then sort of how you use digital media and the internet in your lives. Um, is it just, is it for studies? Is it for interaction with friends? Give us a sense of where you're from and, and how you use it so we can get that baseline and then we'll move into some more you know, specific questions. So, you took my seat. Yeah. You're gonna move around I am. with the mic. I've got two microphones, I'll pass them around and we've got some folks up on the, uh, the dais as well. So we'll so. start up here, but raise your hand, please, and Jim will bring you a mic when when we get to you. Okay. Victor, start. Hello, H hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm Victor Newfeld, and I uh, am from Denmark. I'm with the the youth panel UNESCO or UNESCO's youth panel. Uh, I'm 17, and I am I'm in um, high school, uh, or the Danish equivalent of a high school. Um, I primarily use internet or the the internet for um, educational purposes and cross communicate like uh, cross continental communication with my family abroad uh, and my friends that are s starting to move out of Denmark to other countries uh, like Ireland. I've got friends in Ireland uh, that work there, and I use uh, Sky uh, Skype and Facebook for that. Um, but mostly it's educational uh, what I use and um, uh, for news just. Yeah, uh, broadening my own horizon. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, um, also hear me? Okay, my name is Luca. I'm also from the Danish youth panel um, of in AXO in Denmark in Save the Children. Um, uh, what And also for my, um, I use use it for vlogs at my with a friend, um, yeah, and uh, for my music also. So yeah, that's it. Uh, I'm 14 years old. So, yeah. Um, I use social media for work mainly. I'm a blogger, and so I basically cover the news in my home country. But um, I also use it to keep in touch with my friends because, you know, traveling around, studying abroad, uh, years of experience <laughs> and years of friendship, you have to keep in touch somehow. So I also use Facebook and, um, of course, uh, to 
to keep in touch and stay updated and also for work a lot just not blogging on political issues but I use Skype to talk with my um, friends from the organization that I work for because that's Everybody's based somewhere. Some somebody's based in Georgia. Somebody's based in the U.S. So that's um, uh, why I use it. And um, also news, of course, uh, to get to stay updated. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm Pat Chong from from Hong Kong, and 17 and a secondary school student. So. Um, uh, just like Peter, I, I usually use the internet f uh, for communication, the you know social network like Facebook, um, uh, Twitter. So I uh, use this uh, social network to communi communicate with my friend. Also, uh, youth in Hong Kong usually use the uh, internet for entertainment, like um, um, videos videos game uh, uh, YouTube just like yeah do you hear me yep uh, my name is Berdi Anaslushvili and uh, I'm coming from Republic of Georgia uh, I represent the uh, uh, US based organization PH International uh, in Georgia, we are running a uh, uh, U.S. government-funded civic education and teacher uh, training program, and in general, we are working with 30% of Georgian schools, uh, promoting the civic education as a subject, and also, most importantly, uh, teaching sc uh, school students how to be engaged in uh, solving local community problems. So in general, we teach students, uh, and uh, when we say we teach students, we are speaking about 30% of Georgian schools, which is more than 740 schools and working directly with the school prin principals and school administrators and uh, local community leaders to engage students. And we are uh, very much uh, integrating and bringing social media uh, tools there. Uh, we were the first organizations who printed uh, in Georgia's SMS book, Social Media at School. This is the very first kind of, and all for all this book is next to me, Sandro. And we, um, we started to teach students how to use social uh, media uh, for civic engagement and participation. And also we are kind of teaching students um, uh, their basic rights on the internet because this is something uh, students need to be aware. So we are kind of like a promoting the social media at schools for civic engagement and at the same time uh, providing a lot of trainings uh, and education of um, uh, online safety. 30% is really impressive. I think the last I heard was about 15% of U.S. schools, um, public schools are engaged in, you know, actually using a digital citizenship curriculum. So that's really impressive. Earlier, I forgot, I didn't see my U.K. friends come in. I apologize. We have Lucinda from ChildNet International in London, and she brought some young people from the U.K., so here's another perspective, and, and maybe would, would any of you be comfortable talking about how you use social media for civic engagement and citizenship purposes? Hi, uh, I'm Rebecca Cawthorn. I'm 17 and from Yorkshire in Leeds. In Leeds? That doesn't make sense. Anyway, uh, I use social media. I use a lot of um, social network sites. I use Facebook, I use Twitter. And I go on YouTube a lot, and I think that's what mostly what my friends use the internet for. Um, for homework as well, schoolwork, we use the internet a lot, and within schools. So that's kind of what we use the internet for. Um, gaming, not as much, but yeah, that's that's mainly what I use the internet for. Uh, hi there, I'm Matthew Jackman. I'm also here with the ChildNet International Group. Um, I think. Like most of us, I don't know, I've been listening just just around the room here at the moment, listening to the people from Denmark and people from Georgia. You know, you know, we we, we all use the internet for primarily the, the same things, um, obviously in in different contexts and and we use them at different times maybe. Um, but primarily, I use the same as Rebecca. Um, so education, uh, contact with friends, and you know, generally the internet is becoming a huge part of my life. You know, I I become I'm becoming increasingly more dependent on the internet for 
you know, as I said, education, but also I kind of feel that the easiest way to do things now is through the internet. I mean, uh, just taking this example of education, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go to the library anymore, uh, or as much as I should maybe, <laughs> um, because the internet is a place which, you know, you know incorporates so many things, that, and it's so easy to um, kind of forget kind of real life things and just become dependent, which I'm kind of finding more so. I think I'd stress um, in terms of digital citizenship and how we use the internet that it's becoming a huge part and you know, this, this kind of workshop where we discuss how we use the internet and why we use the internet is, is, is really good and I hope I can contribute a bit more. If I can just add one thing, um, we did a survey um, the month before uh, we came out here and we spoke to 874 young people um, and we asked them uh, what social media services they used and um, over 53 social media services we used. So I think young people are using a huge array of services. I want to, I'm going to throw in a question of my own just to from the youth, just put your hands up. If, you, if you're online for an hour a day, put your hand up and keep it up. Yeah, two hours a day, three hours, five hours a day, do six hours count? a day. Do phones count, Jim, if you're on Yeah, texting? I guess they do. I mean, yeah, well, 24 hours a day, right? But it, I mean, you're spending a, a significant portion of your day online, and as Ann rightly points out, on multiple devices, so that's you know something I think we've got to start to take into consideration going forward. So, so in Hong Kong, are you using the internet more on mobile phones or on the web on computers? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Jim has to get the mic to you. And hello, uh, my name is Kiko, and I'm from Hong Kong. Um, in Hong Kong, we are usually use iPhone or some smart Mac smartphones because we can usually bring the phone to to the streets and we will take photo and upload to the Facebook and the Instagram and let friend knows uh, where where am I and what I am doing. So um, I think it's because iPhone is more easily to to update our status. So it's it's more, it's more popu popular than computer, I think. Yes. And what do you think, Mango? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mango from Hong Kong. I am a university student. I think that um, uh, the internet is a uh, uh, daily life for us uh, because that we use uh, the internet to do many things. Uh, including talking to our friends and uh, to uh, watch news uh, to learn more about uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, the internet become a part of our life, so the internet is so important. Uh, what do you think, Daisy? I'm Daisy from Hong Kong, and I think uh, the teenager in Hong Kong most likely use the smartphone instead of a computer because a smartphone can do everything like uh, uh, sending email and it is more convenient than using a computer. Mm, yeah. uh, okay, uh, I'm Victor and uh, um what I use, or a thing I see in Denmark is that more and more gymnasiums, uh, which is uh, the equivalent of high school, uh, are turning paperless. That would mean that they're starting to, or trying, or moving towards being paperless, or completely not using paper at schools. We that 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 would mean or result that we don't have s books or papers handed out. It all it's all over tablets or computers, and there there are several gymnasiums in my vicinity of where I live. I live in the capital city of Copenhagen in Denmark. And um, these gymnasiums, they do not use paper at all. Uh, so not having internet is, like having internet is vital for your education. You use the internet when you check your schedule, when you go to school, you use your internet for reading the books you, you have in class. You, ha you don't write anything down on paper. You are only working with tablets or computers all the time. And the, 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 the common thing or factor for this 
is that they use the uh, they use the internet right all the uh, constantly to communicate with each other and it just means that as a Dane I am on the internet or as a Danish student I'm on the internet from varying from 8 to 13 hours a day depending on how much schoolwork I do and researching uh, and it's not really social media uh, or if it is it's um, uh, social sciences and then we use it to study um, socialization and stuff like that on Facebook how the internet affects uh, youth um, uh, socially yeah I think that's it thank you Hi there, Kim Sanchez from Microsoft. So just a quick question. That's really interesting to hear that being online is such an integral part of high school life in Denmark. It certainly is very different in the U.S. and I think in other countries. And I'm curious to know, were you ever taught or told or, or did you ever have discussions in school or with your parents about being a responsible Internet user? Did you talk about privacy issues? Did you talk about your reputation? I'm just wondering if you had these conversations before you, you jumped in. Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, mostly in social sciences. Uh, it's, a, it's a great focus. It's also interesting because it's so much, uh, uh, it's, it's a thing that's happening right now affecting us. Uh, but it's more uh, on a broader scale, looking at it on a broader scale, how it's affecting how we're raised. Like uh, the, I don't know the term for it, like first and second uh, socialization, is that the word for it? Uh, uh, like social where literacy, maybe. Yeah, and it's just how your social environment affects affects how you grow up, right? And um, that would work a lot with that. With that. Uh, also, yeah, we talk about how you y how you act as a human being on the internet, and should there be rules? How do you prevent mocking? I've I've we've practiced this a, a bit with Unesa how would respond, but I've also done that in uh, s since eighth grade, like every fourth uh, science uh, social science uh, class would uh, or yeah uh, would have the focus purely or primarily on the internet and how you act and uh, different questions where the classroom will react and discuss so we work with that uh, since uh, earlier I'd like curious to about other people too and their experiences yeah it can are there others who are experiencing um, kind of citizenship social literacy online and offline embedded in school. I heard from Berdia that maybe in 30% of Georgian schools there is discussion about this. How about in Hong Kong? And then we really need to get to Anjan who has remote participants questions too, but I'd love to hear from others. Um, uh, okay, so I hear that uh, about the uh, uh, teaching the student to be a responsible internet user and in Hong Kong, there's there's no such uh, such a educational education that um, in in home parents will not talk uh, will not talk about the internet using how to how to use the internet responsibly, and even not in school, the school just uh, teaching us to some practical skill on using the uh, the software like the uh, work PowerPoint, but but not teaching us how to be a responsible internet user. So uh, in Hong Kong, most of the youth is lack of this kind of uh, knowledge of um, digital citizenship. For me, uh, before before coming this uh, the IGF, I never heard the term of digital citizenship. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know the situation in Hong Kong is quite poor. Anybody else on that? Oh, good. Um, I think there should be more, uh, um, you know, like how to behave on the internet uh, in the school. Um, because in my school, we haven't had a lot about that in yet. Um, and maybe there shouldn't be so much rules, but more uh, the class will talk about how they like the zone to be and how they like the behave to be. And then they could make their own rules about because then you know how your friends want it to be, and you can tell your friends how you want it to be. Yeah. Can I just jump in here and add something to my previous statement? Uh, um, like Olivia, uh, which is the girl that just talked, she's also from Denmark, and it, it varies greatly from area to area uh, how much we've worked with it. It's not, it's not something that the state has went in and uh, made um, obligatory to work with. So it, 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 it varies from teacher to teacher and classroom to classroom how much you work with this. Uh, 
and also uh, like the the kit. Uh, it's really much up to the individual. Like uh, it's more, it's not really teaching. They just ask us the questions and uh, and make us think. And if you discard this in class uh, and don't think about it, then you won't uh, drive much by it. It's not a constitutional uh, or it's not written in our school. Uh, what's it called? The school constitution that we have. Uh, it's a it's curriculum that we have to learn about it. But uh, so it depends on the teacher, and that's just my point. Hello. Um, yeah, so what, what I'd say um, from my perspective um, in how we're kind of taught and how we're educated about digital citizenship and how we should kind of behave online, in my opinion, it's a, you know, for me, it's a, it's a bit too late. I, I'm starting to get the kind of talks, the kind of lessons nowadays, and especially now I've become involved with the IGF, I know I'm thinking about it a lot more. How am I acting online? How is what I'm posting online affecting other people? I think... Uh, I think it was alluded to earlier that you know youth are perceived as digital natives, and in some way, we already know this stuff. We've grown up with it. We should know how to act online, which is completely the wrong assumption. People, we, we should be we should be thinking th this, these people have grown up with it. This means it's they're kind of they need it more. So thus, we should be teaching them more about it um, from the adult perspective. You, you said it's almost too late for you. How old are you again? I'm 17 years old. Okay. Um, so I mean, I've been accessing the internet since you know all my life, really. And it's only when you kind of get to an age where you, you become more independent that you start to get you taught about what you should be saying, what, what, what's right and wrong. Whereas you should be started from the very beginning when you first access your, your internet. You should be thinking, y even if you're just receiving the information, other, you, know, you should be thinking, how do I respond to this? How, how, do, how do I monitor my posting? Um, and stuff like and that. I'm, I'm asking that as the father of a seven and nine year old too. So keep that in mind. A lot of this is personal experience. But I guess um, at my school we use the internet for almost everything because we all, all of us have an iPad. So I guess as much as as much as we use the internet, we should maybe have a discussion about this because we should learn about how we should behave on the internet. So that's just my opinion. Let me let me ask. I'll get to you. Who should be the person teaching you how to do this? Should it be your parents? Should be your school teachers? Is it a combination? What do you guys think? And then, As a, I guess, I guess it should be everyone, just not, just not just the parents or the teachers. I guess everyone should have have um, an, an a responsibility um, for who should make the behavior how it is. Um. You know, the children on uh, their internet is beginning to be smaller and smaller, and they will start from they are very small. Um, so maybe th the smaller classes, like when they are ten or something, uh, could have some you know talks about talk about um, how to behave because they is beginning to be on f uh, different um, pages where you talk with other people, even from that age, um, and learn when they are so small, how to behave. So will it be easier and be, be, um, be, be uh, and stay and talk with them about it because they will be better and better to behave. I keep hearing this word behave, behave, you know. That's really just like one fifth of all the things I hear about digital citizenship. Do you guys think that just comes from adults saying, you should know how to behave online as well as offline. And, and is that citizenship? Talk to me about whether or not, you know, I'm not just speaking to you, Olivia. A lot of people have been using that word, you know, it, it, you know that, that it's about learning netiquette or something, which seems to me kind of diminishing a very, very large global concept. And, you know, I understand that we all need to learn to behave, but don't we kind of already know how to behave toward others, generally speaking, offline? Is it any different online? And I'd love your thoughts on that, wherever you live in the world. Uh, this is my thoughts, or kind of the, the way I was thinking, uh, because right now, youth is, uh, are what, what how I learned how to act on the internet is that uh, I looked at my, my, my comment, like my the, my 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 own youth, my age group. I looked at how were how were they interacting with the internet? What were they doing? And then I mimicked it. Uh, and I think that's how we learn in kindergarten. That's how we learn in 
in the like in I, as small children we mimic our surroundings and learn from that that's what i've been doing but as in like in the physical world what how you're taught is uh, or yeah who's teaching you is for your your dad or your your parents sorry your parents your school your friends right and and on the internet i would say mostly or who taught me was my friends how they acted like they didn't go and tell me how or they didn't teach me how to act but i just mimicked them and did what they did and i think to like for to imagine a perfect world it would be to combine like in the physical uh, like to mimic the physical world and instead of only having one factor affecting you that is um your friends you should also try to at least have an institution or parents maybe both uh and you could theorize that this will be something that's picked up in the future when our generation becomes parents uh because we like will learn for those mistakes i don't know sorry good point there hi Okay, is that working now? Um, we did a survey as child vet about um, how people wanted to be taught about working online, and um, people said that they, that forty one percent of people, no, forty nine percent, sorry, said uh, that they had never been taught on how to conduct, like to act online, with um, sixty two percent saying they wished to be taught by schools, and fifty one percent saying that they wished to be taught. That doesn't add up, but want to be taught by parents and that's kind of what th we w we found out that people don't want to be taught by their friends on how to act online they actually want to be taught by their teachers or by their parents and that's what a lot of young people across the world have said to us could i just um follow up to that that's very interesting because both you and victor are echoing some research at harvard university that found that you know we adults have left our children on their own online partly because of all the messaging that's very about fear that you know the internet is a, this is a dark scary place it's dangerous and so adults have kind of wanted to block internet and block social media because they perceived it as risky they didn't understand it we fear what we don't know uh, what we don't understand right and so i think that um, what the research now is bearing out is that kids are teaching each other and they haven't had the guidance that, you know, they haven't had the adult engagement that they've had in their offline lives. So this is very interesting to hear you guys bear out the research. Yeah, if, if I can go for a second here, uh, there's a strange voice in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Mine. <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Parviz. I am from Azerbaijan. I'm 30 years old and uh, what I've been listening to is very important because I have a small daughter who is four years old and she's all over the iPad, our computers at home, and she's using all the technologies more and more extensively. Now, um, what you said just earlier about how parents, is it really ne necessary for all the parents saying every day to their kids, just behave online, be safe out there? I think um, we're forgetting about one thing here, that people use specific devices to get online. And in my opinion, and we have a Microsoft people here as well, that I think that patterns for the usage of the internet should be better embedded into the operating systems, in the different devices that we're using, which could guide people to a more, you know, to, to a better usage, to a better, you know, internet uh, acquisition, what you call it? And, you know, it's, it's, it's important that, because l lately she's been using YouTube to look at some cartoons. I had a difficult time trying to find a filter which would block all the negative videos. I found it later on, but it you know, it, it, it was a di difficult, I mean, I looked for, uh, Google it up, and it's like, and it, this is just YouTube, because we have all over the internet, we have Safari, we have Internet Explorer, we have Google Chrome, and these are, are the big companies that should care about these things. It, this is my opinion. Thank you. I'll respond quickly to that and just say that, uh, yes, ag we agree from Microsoft that we do have a responsibility in helping to keep you and your family safer online, and we offer tools such as family safety settings and tools in our browser and that type of thing. This isn't a discussion about that, but I'm happy to talk with you later. Um, there are a few points I wanted to touch. Uh, one of them was about teaching and whether or not we should be learning from our parents or from teachers. It's it really, you should really take into account the context of the country 
and the teaching style of the country because not everywhere um, students are have they students have access to technology like iPads or smartphones and have you know the the technology schools. So that's one thing. And I think in in this particular case, when I think of Azerbaijan and when I think of specifically, for example, schools in remote areas and remote regions, you know, you you still have issues with, for example, very basic infrastructure within the schools that alone. Um, have constant internet connection and have the technology. Um, so in, in now in Azerbaijan, like you have a lot of different organizations or you have different trainers who come in and give trainings on, on the use of social media to different networks and different, different civil society representatives. And it's very interesting to see the whole dynamic because when you, when you come into a training, and I've done trainings in the region specifically working with girls, and showing them how to use social media tools. And it's like very basic, how to be active in your community, how to use Facebook, how to blog. And then the whole gender concept comes into the account. And, and it's very strange because you sit in a room and you're supposed to train all these girls, but then you have their cousins or their brothers assisting them in the training because they don't want to leave their sisters or cousins, female cousins alone in the training. And that's another kind of uh, I guess nuance that you have to consider when looking at the at the balance. Um, so yeah, like you kind of and the parents, you know, not a lot of parents are online in Azerbaijan, and so it's it's kind of like you either learn on your uh, on your own or you learn it from the trainings or you learn it from your friends most most often um, in this particular case. Um, and also about like the behavior because we don't really learn about this in schools. It's really difficult to actually explain people how to behave, if that's the, the term we're actually referring to quite often. Um, because you know a lot of people use just Facebook because they think that that's how they connect. Um, I mean, the 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 way they use the language obviously is a different issue. And again, it comes to the kind of the background, whether or not they actually know how to use it and why they use it to begin with. And usually, Facebook is used just like to keep in touch with friends. Arzu, is it different online than offline? Do people feel they have to behave differently or are they just themselves? Well, if you look at the gender aspect, it's both online and offline because, you know, if, if you, I mean, in, in the city, of course, like things are different and it's more modern and the girls have access to a lot of these different um, you know, tools and infrastructure and, and, and um, social networks, whereas in the regions, I mean, there's like a kind of a gap in between. So, you know, if you walk into an internet cafe somewhere in a remote village, you won't see many girls in there. So it's kind of, it, it depends on what aspect you look at it from. Uh. We had a question over here, and I want to remember, I want to go back to Pat after, you know, we've, we've finished that question or that discussion because I'd like to ask you, Pat, what your impression is, if this is a new concept, if it translates into Chinese culture. But we'll get back to that. All right, thank you. My name is Ben. I am um, a professor at a university in uh, Canada. Um, and uh, I teach online. I teach uh, a course on emerging technologies. And most of the students on that course are uh, usually uh, teachers of K-12, to which is translated primary or secondary schools in most countries. Uh, one of the things I found out from this course, predominantly take, uh, taken by teachers, is that they're trying to learn uh, what we have co uh, termed digital literacy, uh, an ability to understand how to behave online and how to use some of these technologies for uh, teaching and learning. Now that becomes very important um, and I'm just, well, during the course I find that they get to learn uh, a, a lot of these concepts and they begin to apply them in their, uh, apply them into in their classrooms. Um, but prior to taking the course, they had no prior knowledge of this, right? So I'm curious to, uh, to know from all of you students here, how much do you think your teachers know prior to uh, you know, uh, engaging with you in the courses that you take, or uh, the the subjects that you're taught, or, or ci uh, civic uh, digital literacy or civic uh, responsibilities online um, that you are told. How how much of that do you think your teachers are aware of uh, before uh, you take uh, you, you you engage with them during those classes? Who would like to? Anybody? 
do your teachers understand uh, if they teach online safety do they really understand what's going on in that space in your life I'd say it depends on the teacher like you have in or at least in in uh, high school in Danish high school you have teachers uh, teaching specific classes uh, that they they've educated against and like my physics te teacher or my chemistry teacher they're not uh, they're not teaching uh, uh, internet or um, di digital citizenship at all uh, my um, my social sciences teacher on the other hand has uh, Work with it a lot, uh, and I think it's ob uh, it's o obligatory for teachers, uh, at least the the newer generation of teachers in Denmark, to address the issue of internet and how and work with that and incorporate that in schools. Also, because Denmark is very focused on using uh, s uh, schooling systems that children can relate to, so they're taught that. Yeah. I think I kind of have two answers for this question, actually. Um, because it's quite a split in, in my kind of educating my teachers and how they understand the internet and, they un and how they understand what is right. I think I'll take the kind of first answer of yes, some of my teachers do understand and they use the internet almost to its full potential. Um, but for example, they take lessons on Twitter, they advertise prep on Twitter, you know, they, pr they use uh, the internet as another edu edu educating source, kind of proving that they know how to access this. I mean, uh, obviously they have to consider all the students and how how they kind of how they s you know how they're going to be because obviously students are going to be accessing the Twitter site at from their own accounts and you know you know so it raises some issues but obviously they understand that so they feel confident enough to use this kind of well use the internet as a s kind of way to educate but then perversely on the other hand I have teachers which if they came to this conference wouldn't understand half the words we used if I said digital citizenship then they would it would be way over their heads they would have no idea and so there's kind of split. Um, also kind of almost damages the use of the internet in my school because there'll be teachers who are young in most cases pro the internet use it as a kind of educating tool where teachers which are completely leaving it aside saying that it's a bit too risky uh, in a sense so they're the kind of two ideas I have in that Hi, my name is Kate, and I'm with UNICEF in New York, but um, just moved there recently, and I grew up in South Africa. And I wanted to bring a bit of a perspective from a continent that seems to be a little underrepresented here, or at least from one corner of it. Um, and this is a good question to start it, because in South Africa and in many other African countries, um, teachers probably have a much lower digital literacy than what you're describing in your situation. So. There are far more teachers who don't feel um, that they're equipped to provide students with support on this topic or that they're just overburdened and there's already so much that they're trying to do with little resources. So it's a big issue because now with the growth of mobile, um, more and more kids are getting connected and connecting online. Um, and the same goes for parents in this case. But I also wanted to bring in that uh, we're talking much about uh, internet and online here, but again in Africa, a lot of the digital interaction is via mobile and not necessarily mobile internet at all, but SMS technology and still some of the things that for the rest of the world may seem quite far behind. But I think it's important to keep those still in the conversation that digital citizenship isn't just internet and online, it's also all those other aspects as well. Oh yeah, I, I, I think that's vital. Um, and we did touch on that in Nairobi last year. You know, we what we came to understand, and especially in a workshop that my co-director Larry um, participated in with Anjan, um, what we came to understand is a lot of people were accessing Facebook, YouTube, etc., on their mobile devices, and and they were actually feature phones, not what we call smartphones. But you know, I really think that we're talking. I don't think that's any different. I think you know. Texting's behavioral too. Um, texting I is just a, a very similar, you know, digital form of communication, just like, you know, Skype chat or Facebook chat or Gchat, you know. So I think we're really talking about the same thing, unless anybody disagrees. I would love to hear if anybody feels that, um, you know, mobile phones are somehow a different kind of place where citizenship is practiced. Um, I really, uh, what I find 
in the United States with teenagers in my corner of the country is that they're more and more moving to the mobile platform themselves. That they, they Facebook was kind of smart to acquire Instagram because a lot of, of the kids in, in Northern California are, are migrating onto just uh, socializing via an app with sort of the photography element. They're much more interested in that than they are in doing so in Facebook on the web. And all of these social services um, have a mobile app um, version. So we, we find in an interesting way that the developed world and the developing world are getting closer and closer together, except that maybe, you know, and we see the, the percentage or the proportion of the U.S. population having smartphones going up, but it's all on mobile more and more, which is really a fascinating phenomenon. Yeah, I've heard I've heard a lot about norms of be. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry, Olivia. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, get back to what you said. Um, that about your uh, the little professor. daughter. What is his name? I want to go back to what you said. Um, I don't think that um, parents should set up too many filters. Um, maybe, of course, it's okay when she has four or something. But I wouldn't think it was nice if my parents set up filters for me because um, so I will feel uh, limited um, in a very bad way because sometimes I have to try something to find out if it's good or bad um, because if everything, I only can do good things, I, never I will never learn. So I just want to say uh, a little bit about that. We also have a and yeah, we've got to get to a remote participant yeah. question as well. Otherwise, I'll get yelled at by the UN. Let me ask. Oh, wait, wait. Same voice again. Eh? Okay. Um, let me uh, get to that. I agree with you, but not all the kids are the same. We also have a much younger generation of the kids. My daughter is like four years old. I mean, she obviously does not need to see a lot of things that are there online. So yes, I take your comment, but no, there there are times when parents decide themselves. And I think that, you know, until my kid has grown to an age when she is uh, an independent, you know, adult person, I will take the courage to decide upon her. I'm sorry. And this also maybe comes from you know, a society, the, tra the traditions that are, you know, we are more traditional society. And uh, no matter how much Western educated I am, I know Zunol knows her best, but, uh, you know, it, uh, we, there are things that we consider important. And one of them is like, you know what's good for your kid. I hope it is I so. think a lot of Americans feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I have a nine-year-old daughter. I'm in your camp. <laughs> I have some job. I'm sorry. I'm Mariam Alton from Inaxo. So when is your child old enough? 18 years old. Okay, thanks. Okay, I just want to say uh, two things. Uh, first off, Olivia at the top is the young, I think she's the youngest youth uh, delegate here, uh, or a member of a par uh, panel. She's 13 years old, um, so that, that should also be taken into account, her statement. And um, the second thing is that in Denmark, I don't know about the rest of the world, so I can't really talk from that, but in Denmark, uh, when kids are, pr kids are perceived young or near adult uh, pretty early because we like if we can throw be thrown into gra uh, jail for example uh, why can't we have to have opinions why can't we take responsibility for our own actions in Denmark the the, the crime age or the cr age where you can be thrown into jail is um, for it's 14 15 but it was it was down at 14 for uh, for some time and I think the general uh, opinion is that if you're for if you can be thrown in jail for your actions, you're also capable to have your own actions. Like that's not, the parents should no longer uh, solely decide what you have to say because you stand, uh, you stand in, uh, what's it called, in regard of, you know, um, you're responsible for your own actions and you will take the consequence, consequence of your actions. Therefore, you should also be able to make your own actions. Hi, Larry Maggot. I'm and co-director of Connect Safely. I just want to say 
Olivia, I am five times your age, and I completely agree with you. I think there are some cases, relatively rare, where parents have children of very high risk and they need to carefully monitor them, just like there are some children where you should check their room to make sure there aren't illegal drugs. Those are the exceptions. The vast majority of young people are capable of making good decisions, and I would much rather have an occasional failure, i.e. going to a place you shouldn't be, than have a perpetual state of being blocked from places that you need to go. So I completely agree with you, and I am by far from a young person. Yeah, I also want to uh, talk about Olivia's opinions. I also agree with uh, Olivia's opinions, since I uh, you know that youth uh, don't like to born by the parents. They they rather they prefer to choose to uh, try something new to know if it's good or bad. So I think you um, parents or in school uh, they would like to touch by parents in school, but they would they wouldn't like to born by them. They don't want to uh, be limited. So yeah, go uh, go for Oli Olivia's opinion. Anjan, do An you have a question? Well, this is. And this is from the remote participant. If I may uh, ask a question now, uh, yeah, did you, you just did you want to follow up on something here real quick? Yeah, just and then we'll close it off after this on this string. Actually, I'm coming from a traditional traditional uh, society too, but I I can I can propose it somewhere in between because there are cultural differences. We can't a general we can't give a general idea for everywhere in the world. And this is society-based, case to case, but we can we can why we should go for the base that the openness is the base, and exceptions are exceptions are made rarely should should be like that, and there is another idea we should put the filter in mind of the people, not in the computers. Uh, actually, you should educate them, advise them most of the time to be friend with them, and you give the good and bad in their in their mind instead of putting the restrictions. I feel the same way. If I, if even if some bad things that I know they're bad, well, but somebody uh, put that restrictions for me, I will try to break and see. It will, it will, in uh, what they call it, it will push me towards bad thing more than that. You know, it seems like we're drifting l more into parenting and child raising and online protection and online safety more than digital citizenship, and I understand that. I mean. Um, you know, digital citizenship is partly about access, right? And so, you know, filtering and blocking software comes into play there. But I, I want us to try to stay on topic and think, you know, this isn't just about digital literacy. It isn't just about online behavior, but also about rights and responsibilities and other ideas of citizenship that, you know, we, we have had for generations. And I would love to take this back to Pat and and ask him if he's thought about um, how digital citizenship, the, the term, translates into Chinese culture, whether or not it's relevant at all, and what it might look like in your part of the world. Uh, or anyone from Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, do you mean uh, how I understand the term of citizenship? Does it make sense to you? Is it a good term? Is it useful in your life? as you use the internet in your part of the world? Yeah, yeah, it's really a good term to uh, describe the other things. So I think digital citizenship, the, the main concept of it is the right and responsibility. You gonna, um, you will find your rights and responsibility in your in real world. Also, you can find those in the uh, cyber world, just like um, the rights like spe uh, freedom of speech, and the responsibility to respect others, to protecting the internet, uh, something like that. And also, I think a very important concept of the digital citizenship is that uh, self-discipline. So um, you know something called um, real name sy real name system. That means uh, you gotta use your real name on the internet, and the other uh, used to know who you are. So you got to aware what you say, you got to say, uh, express your speech uh, respons responsibly. So, um, yeah, some, something like that we've we seen in some uh, essay. And but I think that instead of using policy, using the law, 
education is more important to the youth that uh, make them to understand what is the uh, digital citizenship and it should not be limited by the law, by the parents, by the school, but for um, for the youth, they got to understand. So uh, that's called the self-discipline, I think. Thanks so much, Pat. That, that's very interesting. Anjan, you're up. Sorry for holding you. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. Actually, um, what uh, Anne just asked now is what the remote participant David Miles from FOSI had asked whether there is a better term to frame online responsibilities. And is it, you know, maybe we can ask another young participant because it was targeted to them, just to see if the word, if the term captures the sense of, you know, what we are trying to talk about. I'd love to hear from every region if, if there's a better term. Can so ra raise your hand if you've got a better term. Or if you yeah, like it. Yeah, if it works, right. Yeah. All right, now here's testing my sprinting ability. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, and if you allow me to just make a quick comment please, here. Please. Um, well, uh, coming back to the discussion we were having before, I think it's also important to uh, understand the, the linkages between the risks and the harms. Because not all risks actually lead to harms, so you have to be very careful about this. and the resilience factor that has been asked, you know, how do you prepare yourself? Uh, but I agree with what Larry said, that there are certain things which comes from parenting, right, that um, should probably be imbibed at the very beginning. You cannot just let everything open. Yeah, that has to be clearly articulated. And the, the linkages between risks and harms are not always clearly articulated. That's something that we have to be cognizant of. Thank you. I think that's important too. We've we've heard that from EU Kids Online as well. Uh, this is just about the term digital citizenship. Um, I personally really like the term. I mean, in school, I get lessons on citizenship, which is how do I act in the real life? In real life, how do I present myself? How do I make a good impression? Stuff like that. So it really makes sense to me that this is digital citizenship. It is just the same thing, but online. So really, I think that's a really good term, but that's just personal. Thank you. My name is Jutta Kroll. I'm coming from Germany, and I just wanted to uh, tell you about a project that we are running in the Safe Internet Program of the European Commission, which is called Social Web Social Work, and it builds a little bit on the role that social workers can play in addressing young people and therefore I would like to to learn from the young people around here whether they talk to social workers for example in the leisure time whether they consider social work as an area of trustworthiness so that's my question to the young people thank you Yuta what do you mean by social work social so working in Go ahead. yeah it's um, kind of uh, like um, places where young people go in their leisure time. It's not school work, but it's outside of school where, where they go to youth clubs, for example. So people that are working there and could, could maybe uh, be trustworthy people for young people to talk about what they face on the internet. So have you that experience? Have you those places where you're going, youth clubs, for example, and do you find people that you are talking to them about internet? Is NetMission that kind of organization, or is it is it more for social change in Hong Kong? Hi, my name is Desiree Ho, and I'm from the NetMission program in Hong Kong. Um, NetMission is a youth-led program, and we mainly address issues on digital divide. So most of the work we've done is actually reaching out to the community. So I don't think it's similar to the uh, social work aspect. Um, my name, my name is Janice Richardson. My name is Janice Richardson. I'm coordinator of the Insafe Network in Europe, and I find it rather curious the term that we're using, digital citizenship. Why aren't we just talking about citizenship? Because we do live in an online world. It's the same for literacy. Digital literacy always bothers me. It's so narrow. 
we should be talking about literacy in our online world. And we're online, we're offline. We really don't differentiate. Most of us are online while we're offline here also. So I, I would say, why don't we drop the digital and just go to literacy for the 21st century and citizenship for the 21st century? And then the 22nd. <laughs> I really agree with that, but I'd love to hear, yeah. L I'd like to hear from the young people whether or not we should just drop the digital part. Jim's getting his exercise. Um, I, think you have a, I think you have a good point, but I think the distinction is quite important. I think I'd just mention here again our survey, and I think it was around 50% of people said that they do act differently online. And you know, the internet is a completely different stage. Um, the way I interact on the internet, the way I am on the internet, the way I act on the internet, the way I behave on the internet, if we're using all those kind of uh, ideas, is completely different to our online. The, the idea of digital citizenship with the digital, I think, is important. I think the term in itself, or citizenship, kind of suggests a community. You're belonging to a community, a larger community, a different community online than you are in your day-to-day -day life. And you have to respect that, and you have to realize that your audience is much bigger, and that you must adapt your citizenship from your day-to-day -day life and your, your culture to the online world because of the vast kind of podium it is. So do you behave differently online than offline? Oh yeah, completely. I mean, I think, well, not, 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 not completely. You're really bad online. You flame people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> not completely different then. <laughs> um, I think I, I, I do, I, I. You're more careful? Cautious, yeah, cautious. Defi definitely cautious. Um, respectful. I take I take other people's views that I understand that what they think maybe from a different country or a friend abroad is completely different. So I, I it's more respectful me and more kind of um, conservative, cons cautious me. Um, definitely, yeah. You know, we've had thousands of years of developing social norms as a human race offline, right? So I wonder if this is a transitional thing. I wonder if right now you're adjusting to a kind of different space because it's a new space for behavior and socialization and activity and everything. And if that will change, if we're beginning to transfer our social norms, thousands of years of development of them into the internet space and then maybe we won't have to act differently. I'd love to hear what people think about that. I see another. Can I say something first? Uh, I, I feel as I think I addressed it somewhat uh, in a previous statement, and that was that uh, we kids or uh, friends uh, educate each other on how to act on the internet, and that is social norms. That is bringing norms onto our digitalizing norms. Like I look at how my friends act, and if I suddenly write something that has a very negative response, and uh, I might not uh, correct myself the first time, but if I s continue writing something that only is perceived or is that only receives a negative response, I'll stop writing in that tone or in that manner. And that is the uh, norms on the internet. Uh, I think it's possible you're ahead of us adults uh, in that way. Yeah, and but I'm, uh, I would also say that's how the youth uh, or how my generation learned to act on the internet because my parents didn't tell me how to do. I only observed from uh, like I did, some, I, I wrote some stupid things when I was young, and people reacted to it in a negative manner. Then I didn't write that. I wrote some uh, positive things. People reacted to that in a positive manner. I got the reaction I wanted. I started writing like that. That was how I learned to act on the internet. That is the implementation of norms on the internet, human nature on the internet. Do you agree? Yeah, I also have a comment, Alison from next. So I think it's really interesting to hear Janice and then to hear Matthew because. I'm representing, or I've, I'm part of a network of 25 NGOs across Europe. They all work with child safety online, online safety. And we had this discussion, is digital citizenship a, a good term or not? And we actually decided it wasn't. Of course, we were all adults, but adults representing NGOs working with children all over Europe. And the, point, the key point was that, well, we're all citizens, as Janice said, and the norms that go on in or the work in the offline world also applies to the online world maybe to a, a greater extent, maybe you have to be more cautious and maybe you have to behave more respectfully online, but the same norms uh, work online as offline. So no, for us, digital citizenship is not a good term. We actually start talking about citizenship in a digital era. It's not <laughs> easier to say, but we I think it's a, it's a really good discussion. Thanks. 
need an, we need an acronym for citizenship in the digital era. Um, I'm Jack Passmore. I'm a uh, youth delegate for ChildNet. Um, I agree with what Matthew said in the in the sense that um, digital citizenship is, I think, a great a great term to to sum it all up really because you know online you're talking you're connected to more people you're talking to more people at the same time so people are bound to be more cautious of what they're saying you know concern for personal reputation you know future employers parents things like that you're not going to say something you may say to your friends because you're saying it to everyone online so i think perhaps there may come a time in the future that we can use citizenship to to sum up everything when when o the online community becomes more fused with the real world as such but um for now i think digital citizenship sums it up pretty well what about the caucasus in georgia in azerbaijan um does digital citizenship work or should it just be citizenship um it's a very good um, discussion actually i'm ju i was just like a thinking and uh, was not able to, you know, just to get to the kind of like any decision. But, um, you know, what we are doing actually is kind of um, um, the citizenship in general in Georgia is also kind of um, um shifting, changing. Uh, cha yeah, actually, you know, in um, during Soviet time, you know, citizenship was not a completely, I mean, not a word or kind of behaving. So we started like a teaching or bringing citizenship in practice after in 90s. So we are kind of practicing citizenship almost like a 25 years or so. And when I say civic education, we only started in Georgia to teach civic education, in other words, like a good citizenship and to be a citizen to 2005. So this is very relatively new uh, uh, subject in the Georgian schools. Uh, if you go to like a um, older generation, citizenship is very you know, unfamiliar uh, term for them and uh, they do not really understand what the good citizenship means because in the old times you know you were not responsible to do or solve any community problems which is you know or do any you know actions so, so it's kind of like a uh, new uh, new time of practices in Georgia and you know um, the we are integrating the uh, citizenship and uh, in, in the edu education but at the same time, you know, our organization is doing, uh, providing a learning and teaching on how to be a good citizens and how to use the online instruments to be a good citizens. So in this regard, we do a lot of trainings and teaching students how to write a good, art, how to do a good uh, online journalists, how to do and write the blogs, uh, and what what is do, you know when you do and write the blog, what is behind that. And actually, what we do, we are using social media like a blogs and uh, Facebook to spread uh, the uh, idea of uh, citizenship among peers. So we do kind of do a peer education and training the very uh, selected uh, and um, uh, enthusiastic uh, students to how to use the social media for civic engagement and uh, spreading this citizenship knowledge. And then they are kind of peers who are uh, training or who are kind of, and others are following and are uh, looking uh, the blogs or commenting and just transferring the knowledge of general citizenship to others. So we are not teaching what is online citizenship, let's say, but we are, we are teaching them how to use the tools to transfer the knowledge of citizenship to others, other peers. So this is where we are now. In a way, you have dropped the digital part. You are using digital tools, right. but you are teaching civic engagement or participation online and offline. In a way, you're ahead of us in the West because this has emerged as kind of, a, a, in some cases, not all, a new label for the same old thing, online safety, internet safety. And you know, like it, it, it was a, a more acceptable, maybe a little bit less negative, because internet safety was equated with risk and harm and fear. And you know, I think it, in a way, it's more healthy to approach it as civic engagement online and offline. Do do others agree? You know, tell me if I'm wrong. I, I wanted to say I like the idea of it uh, being a transitional term because I do think that. Um, 
And, and I mean, it shows, I think you, you mentioned it, that when you first started using the internet, you did some things which you then realized were, were not so okay. And I think that large audience that you guys mentioned and also the perceived anonymity and the separation between what you put out and the reaction that comes from it, I think they do influence our behavior and sometimes we don't realize it. But I do think as more and more people become online, spend more time online, it does start to become just about citizenship and not digital. And, and you really start to think first about how this will be perceived uh, online before you even take an action offline. Um, but yeah, I think for the time being, I think it is important to sometimes whether to say it citizenship in a digital age or digital citizenship, I think it's important to keep linking the two. Uh, in Denmark, or uh, with my school, uh, we kind of work with it as uh, international citizen, and not we didn't s we didn't say digital citizen, we said international citizen. And I, I I'm not sure it fits the bill completely, but like the fourth uh, point in our the five key elements, a sense of membership or belong belong belonging. I hear much more uh, like Danish youth. Uh, declaring that I'm not a Danish citizen, I'm an intern or I'm not a Danish citizen first, and there f uh, after uh, international citizen, I'm an international citizen and a Danish citizen second, and that's kids in my age, like 17-year-old uh, high school students, that address this issue and uh, perceive how they belong as being much more uh, or being across borders, right? And that is what we do. Like the internet isn't confined to borders. Like we uh, we communicate in like for Dane uh, Danes most uh, most of the time we communicate or uh, half of the time at least we communicate in a second language. We're writing in English. We're writing to people that are not uh, solely Danes. We're we're addressing issues that are not Danish issues. They're international issues, and we're it's just it's so much more international than it is uh, confined to borders. And there I, I might say that you could also say international citizen instead of digital citizen. working now okay I want to put this into a little perspective uh, Anne earlier talked about that many people perceive digital citizenship to be good behavior that that's a common although I believe incorrect but a common definition and I want to put the behavior question into context the reality is that the vast majority of people including the vast majority of young people behave well online the statistics on bullying are all over the map but the most recent research is showing something like six percent which means that 94% of people are not bullying on any kind of regular basis. Uh, I just looked at, there's a huge obsession in the United States about prisons, like, oh my God, we have a prison population of over almost 5 million people, about a fourth of which are, half of which are drug related. But that means that 97% of Americans have never been involved in the legal system. And so when you talk about citizenship, we really have to understand that, that it's a relatively small percent of outliers who need some type of corrective behavior or some type of reminders on any regular basis. And the vast majority of people kind of get it. And I hate to brand an entire generation of young people just because a small percentage of them are misbehaving. And the other thing in terms of the word citizen, it's a very good day to be talking about it because I come from a country who at this very moment is about to elect our next president. And the reality is that citizenship really means empowerment. As a citizen of the United States, as a citizen of Great Britain, as a citizen of Denmark, you have the power to influence the future of your country. And I think as digital citizens, what I want to see for young people is the empowerment to really influence where this is going, what's going to happen, how this internet is going to serve you uh, going forward. Um, I, I really like what you said in the, in the last comment about citizenship meaning, be, meaning empowerment, because I feel like um, kind of going back to the Georgia Azerbaijan and how does digital citizenship work here? Um, I think that um, at least in, in in Azerbaijan, I feel like there is a lack of knowledge of what it means to be a citizen and the empowerment that it gives you. Um, and I won't give get into details of why this is the case, uh, but um, just to give a kind of a perspective to the country where also in the Soviet Union things were different and after the independence um, there have been uh, I guess different kind of um, uh, shifts in the way people think of, of, of their place in a society as citizens and so this whole 
uh, kind of a different concept of understanding of citizenship it kind of brings it to the digital world as well because because there is no kind of information or educational knowledge on these um, very important factors uh, I feel like there is a gap just in knowledge in general and also how people behave online um, because many times often um, you know people hide behind the digital digital concept and just uh, you know use their an an anonymity and mm, you know comment very negatively or very aggressively and I feel like it's precisely because we lack the education um, especially in our schools um, and just overall understanding of digital citizenship and then them combine what is digital citizenship so yeah hi I'd like to respond um, actually to what Victor said earlier, where in you said that in Denmark, you know, you are responsible for what you do because you can be thrown into jail. Those consequences might not actually be the same online because you can be anonymous. So actually, I think that, ag again, I want to reiterate what um, um, Matthew said, is that you can behave differently online and offline. And because there are no consequences, the law cannot control certain things. I, I do feel that um, uh, actually using s s uh, what Pat said as self-discipline online, is it practical? Because if there are no consequences online in, in the sense that you can, be no you can be anonymous and commit crime online and not be caught, because you have those things in the real world, so you don't do it. But online, a lot of people get away with it, right? And also, secondly, I want to reiterate what the gentleman at the back mentioned, that the audience is a lot larger online than if you are, I think Jack also mentioned this, that the, the, uh, the audience that you can affect is a lot bigger online as well. So I think in terms of digital citizenship as a label, I, I, don't, I think dwelling upon the label itself is not as important as if we dwell on what, what it actually is by substance. So I, I, I suppose what I want to ask is, do you think the fact, do you think digital ci citizenship as a concept is even practical? Is it even possible? Is it just too idealistic? Because who's gonna, no one controls the internet, so who's gonna do it? You know, that that is a really good question to end with. I hope other people will jump in. Um, is it practical? Is it too idealistic? I think, Des, to your point about um, self-control, as, as Pat brought, brought it up. It's so interesting to think about how more and more as borders collapse, as there, there really isn't a way for to control behavior from the top down on the internet, um, the, the onus is more and more on education and the individual. The onus, you know, the protective and, you know, the well-being of everybody depends more and more on self-regulation, self-control, and self-discipline. And, uh, you know, as we think about that, that, that seems to become an element of citizenship. And w we're, we're all going to have to be thinking about how to, you know, the story of trolls has been a huge issue in the United States. Um, you know, people turning up in Reddit and um, reddit.com and harming other people abusing other people anonymously um, in a way that you know the, the website is is not controlling or refuses to control and um, you know what what can we do about that as internet users do we do we need to act more as citizens and take have a better sense of community and help each other out more is that something that falls under citizenship or you know is that an impossible thing and we've got somebody who I don't think has spoken yet so uh, hello, everybody. I'm, my name is Wing. I'm um, the member of NetY Ambassador. Actually, I think refer to the, um, this is necessary for digital citizenship, citizenship the, the terms. I think it's, it's nec essential since um, everybody may know that citizenship, um, everybody may do, for example, may, maybe no spitting, no yelling, maybe like this, you may taught by um, your parents, your, ed your school, this kind of moral education actually is 
it's the same, everybody may know that. At, however, why have it changed of your behavior? Be just because of internet. Internet changed your life, changed your behavior. Then digital citizenship, citizenship can be the terms to, to aware the peoples to more be aware of, to take, keep an eye on um, the problems which trigger by um, internet and to make them to know more about it and it's part, um, particularly on the internet. This kind of citizenship, citizenship is it should be called digital citizenship. Yeah. Yes, I think that maybe there's an aspect of this debate that we're forgetting because some of the leading researchers right now are looking at the way that using online tools are actually shaping the way our brain is performing, shaping the way we are learning and the way that we're acting. And I think we have to take that into account because we're probably five to ten years away from natural computing where we're not actually just going to light up the computer and go online. We're basically going to be online pretty much all the time. And it's really important now to be reflecting also on how is my online activity sh changing the way that I'm learning, changing the way that I'm doing things. For example, we know we're a zapping generation. We know that kids don't read a page. They read on F, and you can sort of see the shape of how they read a little bit down the left column. There are many things we know. We also know that when we move from an oral tradition to uh, a written tradition, uh, we changed very much in the way we acted and the way we were as citizens. So I think we need to take that into account, that we may think that we're leading and that we're acting differently in the online world, but remember that the online world is making us act differently in the offline world too. Hi there. Um, I'd just like to quickly respond to, to I think it's Larry. Um, hi. Um, I, I completely agree with you how you say that the internet is empowering and citizenship is empowering in itself and you know, it's welcoming people to be a part of a community and, and to kind of use the internet in the right way. But as actually Victor said, you know, he got some things wrong. Okay, you said that 95% of people aren't getting it wrong or something along those lines, that most people aren't getting it wrong. But people will get it wrong at some point. Um, I think... Um, as, as you asked, um, you know, that is it, is it idealistic to think that people can get it right all the time? And in a way, yes, you know, it, it's, it's impossible for everyone to get it right all the time. But we kind of, if enough people want to and, and want to educate it and make sure it happens, then yes, it can. So instances where people are getting maybe one thing, two, maybe two things, three things wrong um, can be kind of reduced as such. So I think we should almost aim for um, a reduction in the way people misuse the internet. That's interesting, Matthew. I think you know, we don't get it right all the time offline either. And, you know, we let each other know when we blow it, you know, and we can do that online too. Um, so I, I'm a little bit surprised sometimes at how shocked people are when they see bad behavior online because bad behavior happens offline too. And um, we, we seem to uh, exaggerate our reaction when we see it online sometimes. Um, you know, and we are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so believe it or not, what, uh, over the years that we've done these panels, there are a lot of things that we have not anticipated. Running over today was actually something we did anticipate. So uh, Anne and Kim and others have said if you wanted to continue the discussion in an informal capacity afterwards and throughout the week, please get, you know, find them, seek them out. If you want to stay longer, feel free. Right. We and can then continue. And then uh, just from my perspective, I just want to point out a statistic it's not scientific because I was trying to count while running around, but we've got about 50 people in the room, and I counted at least 27 people with the microphone at any one point. So for a highly interactive session, I think we achieved that, and that's all because of everybody in the audience. So thank you very much for that. Yay, thank you all. This has been great. Uh, Kim, did you want to put a, you want to say anything? Yeah, I, thank you, everybody, for participating. And as usual, I learn something every time. It's the first time I've heard pushback on the term digital instead of citizenship more because of some of the issues that typically get raised around the notion of citizenship. But 
the final point is I think we all have a responsibility. I don't think it should just be kids teaching kids. It, we all have to teach each other. Parents need to teach kids, but kids need to teach the parents. If teachers have a role, we all have a, a, a part to play in being good digital citizens. It's not just uh, for kids. It goes for adults, too. Sometimes adults don't act appropriately online either. So we all have a, have a community, and we all have a role in this community. Thank you. And anything else? No? No, just thank you. We love all these perspectives, and we so appreciate the youth who came. Thank you all very much. And thanks, Anjan, for doing the remote. Thank you very much.